Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. And if you wouldn't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the New Testament book of 1 Corinthians. The book of 1 Corinthians and chapter number 15. The book of 1 Corinthians and chapter number 15. We've been going through together as a church, walking through this epistle of, to the Corinthian church. The Apostle Paul has been working with his church. Of course, he had started the church, had spent about 18 months with him and moved on to the church of Ephesus to start that church. And he had heard by many people that there were things going wrong with the church. And so he takes pen and paper in hand by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit for the purpose of correcting the plethora of things that are wrong with the church. The main thing that was wrong with this church was pride. Pride was the backing problem of everything, that all of the other false doctrines, the false beliefs, and the bad behavior all stemmed from their pride, that they thought they knew better. They had an idea that they were super spiritual when in fact they were babes in Christ. This pride had blinded them. And as we go through, we've already examined that because of their pride, because of this, they're allowing sexual sins within the church. They even have people who think it's perfectly acceptable to go visit uh, houses of ill repute and still be fine. That within this church, the apostle Paul had corrected the behavior that there were church members suing each other. And they weren't able to solve the problems themselves, which is going to tie into what we're covering today, that in the millennial kingdom, we're going to be ruling and reigning with Christ. And there's an expectation that we need to be, learn how to solve problems ourselves without including the outside world, that we should have enough discernment to be able to solve issues among ourselves. With this, he continued to correct their behavior on many other things that were going on. These goofballs thought they were so super spiritual. They said, Paul, 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 we got a great idea. We're so super spiritual. We think that it's not good for us to touch our wives anymore. We're just going to, we're going to remain pure in body and we're just not going to. And Paul was saying, I don't know what you guys are thinking. This is just foolishness. He went on and was correcting their behavior and started getting to more doctrinal things. He started dealing with the sign gifts and tongues, how to order and structure services, that everything should be done decently in order. He puts a good emphasis that everything should be done in simplicity and godly sincerity. And we know that because of pride, we often make things complicated where God keeps things simple. And as we had started this morning, that... Another awful thing had occurred is that there was a group of people within the church of Corinth who were denying there was such a thing as a resurrection. They were teaching people that people, when you died, you just became worm food. There was nothing after this world. And the apostle Paul uses what we would call in history a counterfactual, uses a what if statement to put an emphasis on how important the resurrection was. And he went through seven logical statements that if there is no resurrection, this happens. If there's no resurrection, this. And the conclusion was that we as men are most miserable. But then he reversed it and said, let me tell you the truth. He is risen. Forget all the goofballs out there. They're out of their mind and they're taking away hope from people. What is our hope? Our hope is that the Lord Jesus Christ, who is God, robed in flesh, who came on this earth, lived the same life that you and I lived. Jesus died on the cross. He was buried and he rose again to live forevermore. But that's not it. That's not finished. Jesus, that same Jesus who's alive forevermore is going to come back and take us, give us brand new bodies, and allow us to live with him eternally. That's our hope. Our hope is that this is not it. Our hope is that we get to live forever with him. That is our hope. I'm glad that this is not the best we have to do. I'm glad that this world is not the best we have. And so the Apostle Paul is reasonably upset that to teach people that the resurrection is not true is to steal hope from people. 
Well, the Apostle Paul builds off of that message and he begins to explain in the rest of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 more about the resurrection of the dead. There is no other passage in the word of God that speaks more about the resurrection of the dead than the passage we are going to cover tonight. Notice with me, if you don't mind, the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and notice with me as we begin together in verse number 20. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse number 20. The word of God starts off with this. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all all shall all be made alive, but every man in his own order. Christ, the first fruits. Afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall put down all rule and authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which, <laughs> um, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Else, what shall they do? which are baptized for the dead. If the dead rise not at all, why are they then baptized for the dead? And why stand we in jeopardy every hour? I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus, our Lord, I die daily. If after the manner of men, I have fought with the beast of Ephesus, what advantage it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink and for tomorrow we die. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. But some men, man will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Thou fool, thou, that which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body which shall be, but bare grain, that it may chance of wheat or some other grain. But God giveth it a body as it pleaseth him, to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, and another flesh of beasts, and another of fishes, and another of birds. There is also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars for one star differeth one from another a star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown in a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And with this passage, we have an emphasis here of the resurrection of the dead. The resurrection of the dead. And we're thankful, Lord, for this teaching here, for the resurrection of the dead. Forgive me, I normally have it pointed out where to highlight and underline at, but it is there, the idea of the resurrection of the dead. If you don't mind, let's go to the Lord together and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much again for you being a wonderful God. And as we open up the Bible, we're asking that you would give us great discernment from your Holy Spirit to understand how important the resurrection of the dead is, to give us some understanding, to give us some, some 
um, foresight and that we could see what we do here on this earth matters for eternity. Lord, I'm asking that you would give us wisdom and discernment, that you would show us what our place is and what we are supposed to be engaged in for the purpose of preparing for the resurrection of the dead. Thank you, Lord, and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, remember, the Apostle Paul is dealing with the subject that there are some people who deny the resurrection of the dead. And there's going to be a lot of emphasis placed here on the resurrection of the dead as he's building up to a conclusion. If you don't mind, the first thing I'd like to show you from this passage is Christ and the resurrection. Christ and the resurrection. Verse number 20 is a great hope verse. It says, but now is Christ risen from the dead and became the first fruits of them that slept. Because Christ is risen, we also have a hope in the resurrection. We spent some time this morning, but because Christ lives, we have proof and evidence that we too are going to rise from the dead. We too are going to have brand new bodies. We too are going to be not in this world, but live forever with the Lord. We have the hope and the proof because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It goes on and says that Christ has become the first fruits. This is a very important The feast of the first fruits was the third of seven annual feasts, and it was celebrated by the Jews. It was associated with the Passover and the feast of the unleavened bread. It was kept um, the day after the Sabbath. In other words, it's associated with the first day of the week, the Lord's day. Jesus was in the tomb the Sabbath day after the Passover. The next day he arose from the dead. So once again, it's placing an emphasis of the first fruits. With this, the idea of the first fruits carries the idea that it is the very first uh, offering. So let's say that we were farmers. The very first fruits that came up during our field would often be given to God as a principle of the first fruits. Well, Jesus Christ, raising from the dead, he was the very first one to do it permanently. We know that there were some people who were risen before, but they died again. For example, Lazarus, when Jesus called him from the tomb, he rose, but he died again. So he wasn't permanently risen. He was just woken up temporarily. Jesus, he is alive forevermore. And by the way, Jesus is not going to run out of gas. He's not going to grow old. He's not going to need retirement. He doesn't need a vacation. He doesn't need a nap. He is permanently alive forevermore. And we could trust him because he's alive forevermore. And because of that, he is the first fruits of the resurrection. And we are going to be the rest of the fruits that are risen. He is going to rise us up. He is the evidence because he lives. We too are going to live as well. Notice as it continues on in verse 21. For since by man came death, for by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Now the Bible here is doing a comparison, which it does in several different places in scripture. The difference between the first man and the last man. The first man, Adam, he sinned, and because he sinned, we all have a sin nature. As a reminder, you inherit your sin nature from your daddy. And he got it from his daddy and daddy all the way up to Adam. Remember, Eve may have technically sinned first, but she was deceived. Adam made a willful choice to disobey. That's why he is the one who is charged with sin. He willfully chose to sin. Now, because of that, for the wages of sin is death. Because he sinned, we all <coughs> are sinners. And we deserve to be separated from God. Remember, we are not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. For example, we have a brand new baby in here, six days old, but I guarantee the parents will not have a class teaching the child how to lie. Well, then if the parents won't teach the child how to lie, how does the kid know how to lie? Because she's a sinner. They will find that out very, very soon. In the middle of the night, start screaming and they go check, you know, what's happening, diaper pin. And the baby looks and goes, goo, just wanted attention. Where'd she learn that from? She's a sinner. We are all sinners. We sin because we're a sinner. So that's a problem. 
Because of our sin nature, we deserve to be separated from God. However, because of the Lord Jesus Christ, he has forgiven us and washed us clean of our sin nature. That's what Jesus did so we can live forever. He did a complete work at Calvary to wash us clean, full, free, and forever. What a wonderful God. Remember that Jesus was the kinsman redeemer. That's an Old Testament reference. In order for someone to be a kinsman redeemer, there were three requirements. The first requirement is that they had to be related by blood. Well, may I pose a theological question? Is God related to man in any way? No, not at all. God is God. He's a different being. So in order for Christ to be our kinsman redeemer, he had to be born in flesh so he could be blood related to man. So Jesus had to be blood related to man in order to pay for our sin. The second part of the kinsman redeemer is that this man also had to have the power to redeem, meaning that he had to have the fortune, the ability, the price to pay for it. Well, the Bible says for the wages of sin is death. In order for man to have his sin forgiven, someone must have died. Jesus paid the price on Calvary. He became what the Bible word, our redemption, to buy back. He purchased us with his blood. That this kinsman redeemer had to be willing to pay the price or to, had to have the power to pay the price. Third of all, this kinsman redeemer had to be willing to pay the price. And we know that Jesus Christ was willing. He was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. That means he had a choice. At any time, Jesus, while he was on the cross, could have said, you know what, forget this, I'm tired. Came down off the cross, called the angels, and just wiped everybody out. And he would have been a righteous God for doing that. He didn't have to pay the price. It was a willful choice. He didn't, he wasn't put up on the cross, and he wasn't up there because of the nails, or the Romans, or the Jews. He was up there because love kept him up there. And so Jesus Christ was our kinsman redeemer. He was related to mankind by blood. He had the power to redeem and he had the willingness to redeem. Jesus paid our price and he washed us clean. The first man made us sinners. The second man washed us clean allowing us to live with him forever. We can now have fellowship with God and we can live eternally with God because of what the second man did. Notice again, verse 22, for as in Adam all die, even so, just like the first Adam, Christ shall make, shall have, excuse me, so in Christ shall all be made alive. Notice as it goes on, verse 23, but every man in his own order. Christ is the first fruits. Afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. Here we have when. It says in its own order. That means that when you get saved, you don't automatically go up to heaven. We would like that. But then who would be left here to witness to everyone else? Who would be here to be a testimony? God has left us here. And he said, in your order, in your time, you will get your brand new body, just not yet. I wish I had a brand new body. We'll explain it a little bit later. That's going to be nice. But I don't have a brand new body. I have a sin nature. I'm saved, but I still have the ability to sin. I wish I didn't. But one day, one day, I'm going to have a brand new body that will no longer sin against Christ. But not yet. When will I get that? When Christ comes back for us. In a period we would call the rapture, the calling away. We're going to receive our brand new bodies at that time. Notice as it goes on in verse number 24. Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, even to the father, when he shall put down all rule and authority and a power for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Now in this passage, it's putting the order. So Jesus died on the cross, rose again, and lives forevermore. He's already risen. Now we're waiting for him to come back. When he comes back, we get brand new bodies. Then we have a period which is called the millennial kingdom. The thousand year reign of Christ. Where Jesus Christ will rule on this earth. And by the way, us with redeemed bodies will rule and reign with him. 
Paul had already made mention of this earlier when he was talking about how church members were suing each other. He says, listen, one day it's going to be your full-time job to settle arguments. Why don't you learn to do it now so you're prepared to do it later? That's going to be your full-time job. Settle disputes. Learn how to settle conflicts between each other. By the way, you can if you follow biblical principles. But the Bible says that's what we're going to do up in the millennial kingdom. Because there's going to be lots of people there who are going to be born in a perfect world where very few people die and the population is going to increase tremendously, who's going to have sin natures and do people with sin natures often have conflicts, even if they're good people? Absolutely. We're a part of our job in the millennial kingdom. When it talks about us ruling, it doesn't have the idea that we got people that we're bossing around. It's that we're settling problems. Settling issues, settling disputes. And when you have a population that's increasing dramatically, you're going to need lots and lots of help. That's what we're there to do is help administrate in the millennial kingdom. And so Jesus is up in heaven. The next event is the rapture. When the rapture comes, we get brand new bodies. Shortly after that begins the millennial kingdom. And we're going to rule and reign with together. With our brand new bodies, by the way, we're going to be part of God's perfect government. Aren't you glad we'll have a government that doesn't make mistakes? A government that you don't have to worry about elections? A government that you don't have to worry about fraud? You don't have to worry about scandals? We're going to be part of that perfect government in Jesus' millennial kingdom to help administrate perfectly. Isn't that wonderful that we get to be a part of that? And it's part of the reward of us having our brand new bodies. Notice as it goes on, we see not only Christ in the resurrection, but we see man in the resurrection. How does the resurrection affect us? Now notice if you don't mind in verse number 29. Else, what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? If the dead rise not at all. Why are they then baptized for the dead? Now, don't let verse 29 fool you. Remember, we take things in context. What is the context? Well, the overall context is the church of Corinth had lots of things wrong. So we can't take things with a grain of salt, or we have to take things with a grain of salt, that there's a lot of times he's correcting behavior, and there's some things he just mentions that needs to be corrected, and I'm just not dealing with it right now. This is one of them. The idea of baptism for the dead, which is practiced in some religions today, is the idea that if someone dies, I can have them baptized spiritually on their behalf and they'll earn more merit to get out of purgatory or hell or whatever holding chamber they are. So eventually they'll be released to heaven. Now that's not a true doctrine, but have we already established that Corinth already had issues? So, Paul's not correcting this doctrine here as much as he is to say, aren't you the same goofballs that says there's no resurrection of the dead? Then why bother baptizing for the dead if there's no resurrection of the dead? See, by your own false doctrine, you're saying you don't believe what you... Again, he's just pointing out inconsistencies. He's not endorsing this doctrine. It's not a true doctrine. But he's just trying to say something you guys practice, which is wrong... Does it make sense if you still believe there's no resurrection of the dead? Why even bother baptizing for the dead? So you understand the context now. He's not endorsing it. He's just glossing over something that they do that doesn't make sense to what something they preach. Notice verse 30. And why stand we in jeopardy every hour? I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ our Lord, I die daily. For after the manner of men, I have fought with beasts of Ephesus. What advantage is it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. Now he goes on and says, listen, if the resurrection's not true, remember that's the context, people are saying the resurrection is not true. He says, listen, why am I wasting time getting heartaches and headaches by people If I don't have to, you know what the biggest headache of the ministry is, is wanting more for people than what they want for themselves. Why do I even bother trying to help people out when it's not going to bother anyways? They're going to die. They're going to be worm food. Why waste my time? You know, look at all the things Paul went through. Shipwrecks, imprisonments, scourging, beatings, um, all these things that Paul went through. Paul was pretty foolish to go through there if there was no resurrection of the dead. 
you know what? Why go through all of the hardships and heartbreaks if there's no reward after this? If there's nothing better to look forward to? Why in the world would I bother to allow my life to be miserable in order to help someone out for them to die and just worm food? It doesn't make sense. I mean, I tell you as a pastor, there are times I deal with people and go, what in the world am I doing? Is it really worth it? Read the Bible. Yes, it is worth it. All right, let's go. I mean, it's sometimes it's a lot easier to say, do your own thing. Well, why, well, why do I have to have this heartbreak? Why do I have to put up with it? Now you guys are good people. All right. <laughs> but we all have those people that we know are goofballs that like, what in the world are you thinking? Well, why? Why? Well, I'm thankful that it is worth it to invest and help them out because of the resurrection of the dead. That I could go through turmoil. I could go and inconvenience me. Notice what Paul specifically says on this. Verse 31. I protest by your rejoicing. I have in Christ our Lord. I die daily. What does it mean to die daily? Well, Paul didn't literally crucify himself daily. He didn't literally put himself in the grave. This is the idea of dying to self. What is dying to self? I die to my wants, my desires, my plans, my ambitions, that I give up my life to do what God has told me to do. For example, all right, I, I'm human. You guys be patient. You guys know I've been sick the last couple of days. I was telling some people before service, I'd rather just go home and go to sleep. Have you guys ever felt like that? Maybe you don't want to go to work. I'd rather go home and go to sleep. (laughs) Then what are you doing up here? Because it's still worth it. I die to what I want in order to be used of God. Now, don't take pity on me. We're all human. You guys have been there, done that. (laughs) But you know, there are times that we don't want to, but I die anyways to what I want to do in order to be used of God. Well, if there's no resurrection of dead, I'm missing a nap. I'm wasting my time. I could be doing something better that I want to do. But because the resurrection is true, this is not a waste of time. This is worth it not to do what I want to do, but do what the Lord wants me to do in order to watch God work. I die daily. Paul is saying that, listen, if there's no resurrection, I'm wasting time dying to self. I might as well enjoy my life the best I can. Live, drink, be merry. Let's just have a good time. Let me eat as much mashed potatoes and gravy as I want. Greasy pork chops. I meant, let's go to Chick-fil-A and just get everything we want. I meant, let's do that. Rather than work a job, deal with people. I meant, Paul is saying, because of the resurrection of dead, this is not a waste of time to die to self, to invest in others, to help people out, to work with people who don't want the help. But you help them out anyways. It's still worth it. Notice if he goes on in verse 32. For after the manner of man, we just read that. Paul is saying, I fought with beast. The beast there is not real beast. It's dealing with people. I know often I say people are not the enemy. My kids have been joking lately. People are the enemy. But we know that there are some people that are against us sometimes. Why put up with them? Paul's saying, listen, it's not a big deal if I'm doing it for the Lord. I'm dying to self. Verse 33, be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. Now, don't take that phrase out of context. What is the context? The context is the resurrection is true. Therefore, it is good for us to die to self and give up what we want to do in order to serve God. But because there's a teaching of there's no resurrection of the dead, the conclusion is do whatever you want. Well, when you tell people to go do whatever they want and they go do whatever they want, are you surprised the bad behavior they get into? They could do absolutely crazy stuff if you give people permission. Hey, there's no consequence. You won't go to jail. You watch people do all kinds of stupid stuff. People are foolish and stupid. And he says, be careful. Be careful what you're teaching because your evil communications that's hurtful This idea that there's no resurrection of the dead, it corrupts good manners. People act on what they believe. uh, Belief affects behavior. If you believe that you're going to stand before God and give an account, it changes how we behave. If you believe that people are watching us from heaven, it affects how you behave. If you realize that one day that you are going to 
be a leader and God is going to use you and that there's a reward, it changes the way you behave. But if you believe there's no reward, no consequences, no judgment seat, I do whatever I want, it affects how I behave. Which again, we see in our country all the, over the place, people who don't believe the Bible's true. And so their conclusion is that I could act however I want. And we're not surprised when they act all kinds of foolishness. This is how important doctrinal teaching is. That when we teach people incorrectly, their behavior will reflect it. But when we teach good doctrine and teach them to follow after God, their behavior is affected. Notice as we go on. Verse 34. Awake to righteousness and sin not. Notice what is the sin that he's going to be mentioned. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. What is this knowledge of God? Knowing Christ personally. This verse here is all about soul winning. What is the sin? Not telling people about Christ. Paul has said, I speak this to your shame. Our only purpose, why aren't we, as soon as we get saved, taken out of this world? Because God wants us here to be a witness to others. And when we fail to do the one thing that God has told us to do, we're sinning. And people will not go to heaven because we haven't told them the good news. This is the one thing that God has given us to do. What was the whole purpose of Jesus Christ? The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. What Jesus did is he gave us that same purpose. He says, I'm going up to heaven. You carry out what I started. Seek and to save which was lost. We're to go soul winning, to tell people who don't know about Jesus how they can know for sure that they're going to heaven and be forgiven of their sins. Now, this makes sense. Let's imagine, if you don't mind, that I came up with a pill that cured every single cancer. And what's more, I'm able to make this cheap. It only cost a couple of cents. Now, if I had a cure for cancer that only cost a couple of cents, and I said, you know what? This is just too important. I'm just going to keep it to myself. Wouldn't I be guilty of everyone who died of cancer? Absolutely. Wouldn't I have a responsibility, a duty, that if I had the ability to cure all cancers in a pill that cost a couple cents, wouldn't I have a responsibility to give that out to as many people as I possibly could to save their life? Absolutely. Well, we have something better than a cure of cancer. We have forgiveness of sins that we can have fellowship with God. And the low, low price is free. Free. God has already done all the work on the cross of Calvary. All that people have to do is believe the promise for themselves. And so if we fail to give out the cure, we're guilty. This is why he says, sin not. This is why he says, awake to righteousness. This is why he said, I speak to this to your shame. Because we have the free gift of salvation to offer these folks. And that no one has to die and go to hell. With this, we now switch subjects to the idea of our bodies and the resurrection. Our bodies and the resurrection. Verse 35. But some man will say, how are the dead rised up? And with what body do they come? So people will often ask this question. As a preacher, they'll say, preacher, is there anything in the Bible about being cremated? Should I be cremated? Should I have a, uh, uh, a full funeral? Should they put a lot of formaldehyde in me so to make sure that I don't decompose? I mean, when, when Christ comes back, I meant we want to have a pristine body. You know what? Not me. I want the whole thing burnt down so God has to start with brand new materials. I don't want him to use any of the old stuff. Yes. But you know, some people will try to get super technical. So how is it that we're going to be risen from the grave? I mean, does it start just slowly and dust up or what? Paul is saying, listen, you're foolish. Listen, we don't know. God doesn't say, he does say, we're going to be risen up. That's it. But he does give us some more about what, how our bodies will work. Verse 36, thou fool in response to the people asking the technical question, saying, we don't know and I can't explain it to you. He says, that which thou sowest not is quickened except it die. Meaning that you can't get a brand new body unless this one dies. Verse 37, 
And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not the body that thou shall be. Meaning that the body that you die in, that's not the same one you're getting back. You're getting a brand new one. Verse number 38, but God giveth it a body as it pleaseth him. And to every seed his own body. Verse 38 is important. God's the one who chooses what type of body we get. Now he's going to go on and explain it some more. But we need to remember that God's the one who gives us the type of body. By the way, the verse that starts off this passage is the idea of soul winning. There are many verses, we're not going to turn there, but in, uh, in the book of Daniel chapter 12, it gives the same premise of this, of getting our brand new body, and it ties it to the same thing. Our brand new body is based off of this, us winning souls. Us using our influence to see people come to know Christ as our Savior. It is going to directly affect what our body looks like. Notice if you don't mind as we go on. Verse 39, all flesh is not the same flesh, but there's one kind of flesh of men and another flesh of beast and another of fishes and another of birds. So verse 39 is a practical science thing. Not all flesh is the same. For example, your flesh feels different than the service dog's flesh, right? Everyone pets Taylor. It does not feel the same. Why do you all pet Taylor and not pet each other? Because it feels better to pet Taylor, right? I mean, it's a different type of flesh. I mean, why do you pet the cat, not your child? I mean, it feels different. Fish feel a lot different to the touch than the cat does. It's a different type of flesh. Well, I think of Esau, that... They tied into full uh, blind Jacob and they put on goat's hair. And how hairy was that guy in the first place? You know, when goat's hair was able to fool the blind guy and go, man, you feel just like my son. I mean, that's a whole different story. But how hairy was that guy? So verse 39, God is putting that there's different types of fleshes. Verse 40, there's also a celestial body and bodies terrestrial. But the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. All right, so now let's define our terms. The idea of terrestrial carries the idea of earthly bodies. We are made up of earthly flesh. We operate a little bit different than our celestial or our redeemed bodies, our brand new bodies. And it's using the word celestial on purpose. Notice it gives a ref, uh, reflection of this in verse 41. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon. Another glory of the stars, but one star differeth another in glory. Notice in verse 40, you have the word glory. And then in verse 41, you have the word glory four times. That word glory literally carries with the idea of shine of shine. It carries the idea here that there is uh, our bodies like the sun. And let me just get the context. For example, we, the sun shines differently from our perspective than the moon, right? Yes. When the sun's out, everything's covered. When the moon's out, you can still see the stars. It doesn't shine as brightly. You look at the stars. Do you know the stars are suns as well? But do they shine the same? Even if you were able to go past our atmosphere, do you know that the stars are different colors? You have red stars and white stars and blue stars and green stars and yellow stars. They're all different colors and they all have different magnitudes and different ways that they shine. And so God is saying, all right, we know that things shine differently. By the way, God's the one who gives us the body. And by the way, it's all based off of our servants and soul winning for him. Notice verse 42. So also, so the celestial bodies, so also, just like this is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption and raised in incorruption. What the Bible is saying here is that our brand new bodies, by the way, the Bible says in another passage, that our brand new bodies will not be able to sin against God. Praise the Lord for that. We kind of mentioned that. But in addition, our brand new bodies will shine, glorify, based off of our service for God. You say, well, how does this work out? Well, remember that in the millennial kingdom, our job is to help administrate. And part of our reward is our brand new body that's going to be a reflection of our service to God. So if you had someone in the millennial kingdom... And you're looking for answers and you have your normal flesh. You're looking for someone to help you out. You want to go, go to the person that's shining the brightest. 
That was someone who was trusted by God and served God on earth or uh, before the millennial kingdom. You don't want to go to the guy who didn't do anything. It's all black and, and darkness and like, uh, I didn't do anything for the Lord. Would you go to that guy to get answers? No. What happens is that this is a quick thing. That's someone who served God while they had the opportunity. Their bodies are physically reflecting it. By the way, what was the service? Soul winning. Us using our lives, dying to self to see people come to know Christ as our Savior. Using the life and influence that we have to reach others for the gospel. It does matter. It matters quite a bit to invest our lives now in helping the gospel get out. And when we get our brand new bodies, part of the reward that we get is God says, you were faithful. Let me choose you a body that's going to be a reflection as evidence. This was someone who served me while they had a chance. This becomes a big deal because how long are we going to have these bodies? For a thousand years during the millennial reign of Christ. That's a long time. That's a little bit longer than you're going to live now. So for a thousand years, you're going to bear the effects of your service for God now. What you do now matters for a thousand years. What you do now is going to be shown publicly of how well you could be trusted in the millennial kingdom. This is a big deal. You see, our brand new bodies are going to work differently. Now, other passages give other reflections of what our brand new bodies are. It is believed that we could fly. That's going to be helpful. I'm looking forward to that. That we could transport pretty quickly back and forth. That's going to be great. That's whole different studies. But the main thing for here is our brand new bodies will not be able to sin against God. We're going to serve God in the millennial kingdom. And they are going to shine and reflect based off of our servants and obedience now while we had the choice to die to self. The choice to serve God. The choice to be obedient to him or live our life however we want. Because we chose to die to self, because we chose not to do what we wanted to do and give our life to the Lord. Our reward is a brand new body that's going to be a reflection for a thousand years. God says, I trusted them. They were faithful to me. This is a big deal. I don't want to go to the millennial kingdom and be like a weak white nightlight that's ready to die. I want to be able to read a reflection. God trusted me. I was faithful to him. And it's reflected in the brand new body that we have. Remember, not everyone's going to get the same reward. Up in heaven, there's no precipitation, precipitation, parsip, whatever, uh, trophies, rewards. The idea is that God has given us all opportunity and ability. Our race isn't against everyone else. It's against our own opportunity and our own ability. You will meet people that I will never meet. So you have the responsibility to influence them. And I have the responsibility to influence people in mine. We all have different abilities. It's based off of how well I was trusted with the ability, the time, the opportunities that were given to me. Notice as it goes on, as it wraps up this idea of the millennial kingdom and our brand new bodies. Verse 42 again. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, raised in corruption. It's no longer going to be able to sin against God anymore. Verse 43, it is sown in dishonor. It's going to be raised in glory. Listen, this old body is filthy and nasty and dirty. Amen. I'm going to get a brand new body that's going to shine in glory and a reflection of who God is. It is... Sown in weakness. Oh, I'm feeling more and more how weak my body is. I'm getting a brand new body that's going to be full of power. That's not going to fall apart. That's not going to run down. That's not going to need titanium pieces replaced into it. I'm going to have brand new body that will not rust or corrupt. I want that body. I'm looking forward to that. Verse number 44. It is sown in a natural body. That's what we have now. It is raised in a spiritual body, a different body that operates differently. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Here we see the idea of the resurrection of the dead. There is a resurrection. Paul spends a lot of time earlier in the chapter. There is a resurrection. But as we go on, we see how important it is for us. 
I'm looking forward to having a brand new body that will not be able to sin against God. I hope that you're at the place where you're tired of sinning. You're tired of messing up. You're tired of failing God. Now I'm thankful that even though we don't have a brand new body, God has not left us by ourselves. The Bible gives us in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In just a few minutes, we're going to observe the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is a local church uh, um, ordinance. It is for the local church. But the purpose is, is for the local church to examine ourselves And if there is any sin that needs to be dealt with, we're willing to confess it to God and allow God to cleanse us. That we can be as right with God as we possibly can, even in these old rotten, nasty bodies. I'm thankful that we can be as right with God. We're not going to be perfect, but we can be right with God. This is important. Let me tell you, dear friend, one day we are going to have a a body that can't sin, sin against God. I'm looking forward to it. But now we do have a body that can sin, but we don't have to. And if we do sin, we can get it right with God. One of the problems that the church of Corinth had, and we covered that a couple weeks ago, is that they didn't want to get right with God. They didn't want to admit that they had done things wrong. They didn't want to admit that they had messed up. They didn't want to admit that they sinned. They didn't want to admit that their doctrine was bad. They didn't want to admit that their sexual sins was wrong. We don't need to get to the place. We need to be agreeing with God. That's what the word confess means. I agree with God with what he says. So dear friend, I want to ask you, we don't have a brand new bodies. We have a corrupted body, but are you confessed up? Are you as right with God as you possibly can? In just a moment, we're going to have an invitation. There's nothing magical about the invitation, but I want to invite you to go to God and say, Lord, is there anything I need to get right with? Is there anything I need to confess? Is there anything that maybe I'm not even aware of that you need to point out so I can get right with you? This becomes a very important time that if we want to be usable instruments in God's hands, we need to be as right with God as we possibly can right now. Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you can give us a call at area code 920 530-6308. Once again, that number is 920-530-6308. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, please let us know. We would love to make ourselves available. Thank you.